Yeah, thank you, Alexa. Yeah, we are actually joined on the phone by the deputy director of the National Hurricane Center, uh, Jamie Rome. Jamie, thank you so much for joining us this uh, afternoon. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, last time we spoke was a few years ago, one of the weather conferences down at South Padre Island. And I guess I'll start with one thing. Uh, you came from a background of storm surge with uh, regards to your work at the Hurricane Center now as deputy director. But storm surge, something that we have really been pushing uh, as one of the main threats uh, with this storm with Francine. Uh, can you kind of bring us, uh, kind of take us along the Louisiana, Mississippi coast is what you think some of the greatest concerns will be from the surge? Yeah, I think surge and water in general is going to be a big problem. Um, right now, based off this forecast, the, the eastern portion of Vermilion Bay would be sort of the, the primary target area. But it, generally, anywhere you know, along the coast, especially east of where the center ultimately makes landfall, um, is going to be problematic because in top of all that surge, you're going to have the, this heavy rain and, you know, the rain is going to try to flow into the ocean and it's not going to be able to because the ocean is going to be elevated from the storm surge. So you've got these two forms of water colliding um, and where they do, you're going to just get a, a real big flooding threat. So that's something we've really been pushing for all of our coastal communities and especially anyone outside of the hurricane risk reduction system will be that rising water. Uh, you know, about when would we expect to see the, the, the kind of the peak of some of these storm, storm surge totals uh, on Wednesday? It would probably be in the afternoon to evening hours sort of commensurate um, with, with when the center uh, moves ashore. Um, but I think the water is going to linger uh, long after that. So I think tomorrow night could be especially treacherous for driving and people are going to naturally want to get out. You know, as the storm moves through, they're going to want to see what happened, what see, you know, see what's going on in their community. And I want to caution people not to be driving out tomorrow night because I think we're going to have a lot of standing water in the area and, and a lot of uh, roads are, are going to be unsafe. Yeah, we will see kind of based on the model trends, kind of a, a wind shift to favor a direction to maybe start pushing that water away from our coast and out of the lakes by Thursday morning. But it doesn't look to be a very strong wind. So you think that may be a lingering concern even maybe toward the weekend? Maybe it's not so much quite that long, but we've seen this time and time again when water gets shoved up into these uh, you know, backwaters and bayous, it often takes a long time for them to drain out. They kind of sit there for a little while, a day or so. And then when you put all that heavy rain on top of it, it's, you're just gonna have water just kind of stuck in place uh, for a little bit of time. So just because the storm moves away or you know looks like it's clearing from a rain perspective, I think you're just gonna have a lot of standing water you know, some roads are probably going to have that water in it and you're know, not going to be safe to drive in. And it's really hard to see at night. And we see this time and time again where people are out driving at nighttime and um, get themselves in trouble. I mean, fantastic advice for, you know, folks that want to get out on the roads on Thursday to maybe assess damage or go see properties or, you know, a lot of folks have fishing camps. Uh, try and avoid doing that on Thursday. Maybe wait for government officials to get out there and then start giving the all clears, which I'm sure we will get throughout the day Thursday uh, for our residents. Uh, one thing that we were talking about everything kind of to the east of the storm, and we have seen this this jog of the model to the east. We've been kind of using uh, uh, Marsh Island as almost a, a point of reference where yesterday the models had stayed to the west. Then we saw a fairly dramatic shift to the east. Why have we seen this shift? And do you think this is a, a shift or a trend that could continue uh, up to landfall tomorrow? Yeah, we see these sort of uh, shifts uh, left and right um, with every landfall. And I, unfortunately, I think people make too much of it. Um, I think they're so focused on where the precise center uh, moves ashore that it, it's almost like uh, they lose sight of the forest for a tree. And because the hazards are going to be so far removed um, from the center, you know, the rain's already occurring over your area. Um, and so if people focus solely on where the center of circulation moves, um, they're probably going to get burned with this particular storm. I mean, that's the great advice and something we always try and cover that the fact that the cone is not the entirety of the storm. That is only the center point that is forecasted real quick. The dry air has played such a huge role 
in, in keeping Francine a, a fairly weaker system that we're, models were indicating, why don't the models do as good of a job with uh, kind of bringing in this dry air as such a large component? Yeah, so the dry air can be a double-edged sword. So it, it can inhibit intensification, but it can also increase the gust potential. So we could see a situation where the overall storm is weak from a sustained wind perspective, but the gust spread inland. Uh, one of the reasons why we have a hurricane watch up for the greater New Orleans area, you, you, sometimes you see these storms, they, they carry the gust uh, farther inland than people are really anticipating and, and you know, really presents a challenge from down trees and, and power outages. And I think something that is, is new this season are those inland watches and warnings. Uh, maybe take us a little bit through what the thinking was in introducing that, that uh, maybe allowing folks to understand that this is not just a coastal concern, but even well inland. This is, again, something new this season. Yeah, I, I mean, I think we were doing a really good job of communicating the coastal impact and people along the coast knew how to interpret the products, knew how to interpret you know, hurricane warnings and the cone. Where we were running into problems is people inland um, were not fully understanding their risk because the risk wasn't depicted on the cone. We weren't showing the inland watches and warnings. And you can see now, this is a representation of the new cone. Look how far inland this color these color, these are depicting the wind watches and warnings. I mean, almost making it up here to Jackson, Mississippi to show, sort of show you, you know, how far those winds can punch inland. And that was something that people just weren't realizing before. All right, Jamie Rome, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate, appreciate your insight into kind of the behind the scenes thinking with the folks at the Hurricane Center.